Good morning, everyone. This is Kim Bailey with Alzheimer's Orange County, and I'd like, you, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Oral Hygiene to Decrease Risk of Infection in Older Adults. Uh, these complimentary webinars are brought to you through a collaboration with O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices, Hospice and Palliative Services, and Alzheimer's Orange County. And these three sponsors come together to provide these webinars on a monthly basis uh, as a service to the senior community on uh, topics that are beneficial for anyone who cares for and works with older adults, uh, be they a professional or a family member. And we certainly hope that you find our topics and seminars informative and useful and always look back to your Look forward to your feedback um, on ideas for topics. Now let me just introduce you to our two highly qualified speakers today. Uh, Joria Rainbow Clemente is, uh, has a BS in nursing and a master's degree in nursing uh, as an adult clinical nurse specialist. She is currently a clinical nurse specialist, medical surgical uh, telemetry departments uh, in those departments, as well as nursing improving care of health system elderly uh, coordinator at Kaiser Permanent. <laughs> Hello, I think I need a little help with my communication skills today. Kaiser Permanente, Orange County. So uh, you can see that she is eminently qualified to discuss the topic today, along with Araceli uh, Soto, who is also an RN, uh, holding a BS in nursing and a master's degree in nursing. She is currently a critical care nurse at Kaiser Permanente. Pernman, I, I just have trouble with that word. I'm so sorry, everyone, <laughs> at Kaiser, Orange County. Ms. Soto is certified in ACLS, BLS, PALS, Critical Care Nursing, Stroke Assessment, and is involved in several process improvement projects. She is a member of the National Association of Hispanic Nurses. So uh, I want to go ahead and turn our presentation over to um, our two qualified professionals. And again, as we go through the session, we'll be having poll questions. And as you come up with your questions for our speakers, you can type them in the chat box. Um, now, it's my pleasure to welcome Joria and Araceli. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending our oral care presentation this morning. Uh, my name is Araceli Soto. Myself, along with Joria, we will share some topics with you on the importance of oral care. Uh, just a little background for you. In reading some of the recent literature, we find uh, articles that talk about the struggle to perform oral care, particularly in patients with dementia, and this places them at a higher risk for infection. So we thought that this would be a, a very good topic to share and to just explore with you. I'm gonna start with uh, the benefits of good oral care. Uh, some of the benefits will include, of course, having a clean mouth in the morning, being ready to start the day, helping relieve some of that dry mouth, particularly in our elderly patients, and keeping a fresh breath which helps to uh, have a sense of good oral hygiene. Setting a consistent schedule is uh, another important thing. Um, essentially doing all these things for our patients or loved ones or the people that we care for helps to start their day in a, on a positive note and boost their self-esteem. Self it also gives some predictability in their routine, which, you know, as we know, a lot of times that may be lacking and it, it decreases the fear importance of good oral care, I'm going to move forward, um, is to uh, improve the hygiene, of course, and uh, particularly to help decrease the risk of infection, um, keeping our lungs healthy, uh, helping improve the patient appetite is a big one, because if they feel like they have you know, things in their mouth, residue. Um, a lot of times we've, I've seen patients that have a little bit of film on their tongue. It definitely dulls the senses and they can't taste the food. So if they can't taste it, their appetite is definitely gonna suffer. 
Uh, patients feel better when we do this for them. There's a sense of improved quality of life. Um, let's see, it also helps to control blood sugar, uh, which decreases the risk of complications due to diabetes. Um, decreasing the gum disease also helps decrease uh, heart disease and strokes. And we're gonna go on to our next slide. So it's a uh, best oral care schedule. Uh, brushing your teeth with a soft toothbrush with nylon bristles twice a day. It's important to use a pea size or less amount of toothpaste. There could be some uh, preference on taste and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Gently, making sure to gently brush the teeth in an up and down motion with soft strokes. Uh, uh, brushing the tongue, as I mentioned, sometimes we get that film on the tongue that we want to remove to help the patients have a, a good sense of cleanliness as well as taste and improve their appetite. We want to make sure that they rinse. And finally, just apply some lip moisturizer. As you'll find, um, I work at a healthcare facility and I know the air conditioner definitely help, definitely um, dries out my mouth and our lips. And for our, our next uh, item would be uh, best oral care schedule. Uh, this is important. It's important for us to, uh, for patients that can use a toothbrush, have them use a toothbrush, keep it in a dry, clean place. For those patients that have dentures, it's important that we treat them like natural teeth. Keep them as clean as possible. So uh, we want to remove the dentures at nighttime and also after meals if, if needed and make sure that we soak them to help remove some of those food particles that can build up on those dentures and um, that's where the bacteria can grow. We don't wanna use any toothpaste as these may scratch the surface of the dentures and that's where the bacteria can sit. You may use a polydent or other denture cleansing tablet if you'd like and just be sure to use warm water and not hot water as the hot water can break or damage those dentures. Should I use or change, should I change my toothbrush every three to four months? The answer would be yes. So we wanna prevent bacteria for build, from building up on those bristles. We also wanna change those toothbrushes out sooner if you find that your patient cared, care uh, or loved one has had a cold, the flu, a mouth infection or a sore throat, and sooner if those bristles are worn as this helps to reduce the effectiveness of brushing. I'm gonna show you some pictures here. They say pictures are worth a thousand words, and um, looking at this, I'll explain, and I'm sure it'll bring up about 10,000 words we can describe here. Um, we got these wonderful slides from our friends, Diane Baker and Barbara Quinn, who have done extensive work on hospital acquired pneumonia and the prevention of that using oral care. So we thank them for these slides and they talk about how most pneumonias start in the mouth. So the importance of a clean mouth um, to prevent that is um, the next topic. And I know there's a lot of big words here, microbiome and microaspiration, but I don't want you to get caught up with those words. Um, the microbiome, it's just a fancy word for all the organisms that live inside your mouth or the environment of your mouth. Um, these and the organisms that do live inside our mouth play a vital role. We need them there. Um, it helps our health by some of these organisms breaking down our food into energy, some help with digestion, and some even produce vitamins. So, um, and as Araceli talked about before, there's all other there's other kinds of healthy organisms in the mouth too. So, what happens then when all these 200 billion microbes in our mouth um, begin to break down, or there's a disruption in this micro? biome, which can happen when a patient's maybe hospitalized or not feeling well or doesn't have optimal oral hygiene, what can happen is there can be changes in the saliva pH, which is the acidity that helps those organisms break down food and help digest food and its production. So that can change. And also within 48 hours, we start seeing um, patients who don't have good oral care 
these pictures will show you the hourly progression or three hours, five hours, and seven hours of pathogens. And we say HAP, that's hospital or healthcare acquired pneumonia. Um, these pathogens will overtake the natural good organisms in the mouth. And the risk of that, as you can see, when you get up to the 13th hour, there are quite a few of the more um, infectious pathogens that can occur in the mouth 13 hours after having um, your, te your tooth brushed well. If you can imagine this in a person who's not as healthy, because these pictures are from a healthy mouth, um, you can imagine if someone is uh, immunocompromised or doesn't have good oral care, how these pathogens and, and um, potential infectious organisms can take over and it can be dangerous, especially when it comes to that big word here, microaspiration. So when I talk about microaspiration, if any of you have ever had something you swallow and it goes down the wrong tube or we say, oh, it went down the wrong pipe and it might choke you up a little bit, most healthy people are able to produce a cough that's good enough to bring that up and um, you won't choke on that. But then we have some of our older adults, especially our patients with Parkinson's or our patients maybe, or our loved ones or family members that we're caring for with um, strokes, um, difficulty swallowing. Microaspirations can end up going not down the right tube, but the wrong tube into the lungs. If you can imagine these microorganisms that are infectious here, or the, the breakdown in microorganisms, and all of these germs going down into the lung, what that can cause is bacteria in the lungs. So we want to make sure that by doing oral care and cleaning out that mouth, we can decrease the amount, especially if we can do oral care more than once a day, if that's a possibility. So let me move on to the next slide and show you if we don't take care of and we're not able to brush those teeth and clean the mouth, that we can start seeing things attached to the sides in the form of plaque. And you've probably heard of these on um, television commercials about toothpaste and dental visits. You might hear about plaque. And these are the structures that attach to the sides of the teeth and the gums, and it's a formation of all of these sticky, um, we call it a biofilm, but that just is another fancy word for all the little organisms that fit together and get sticky and can cause a um, place where that harbors bacteria in the gum line. And you might have heard also of gingivitis or swelling of the gums. So you, you might see this too. Um, and the only thing that takes this plaque away is a good brushing with a toothbrush. So really important that we get in there and brush this biofilm away and allow those natural good organisms to take over. Here we go. And it shows here that it just it takes less than 48 hours in a healthy mouth for these things to happen. So if you go a couple of days without brushing your teeth, these are going to automatically start collecting in your um, close to your gum line. And the colonies develop and they here's another big word. They secrete pro-inflammatory cytokine, cytokines, excuse me. Again, very fancy word for they cause swelling of the gums. And when we see swelling, we think of infection. So I just want you to um, again, these pictures are worth a thousand words, and they're the reasons why we need the good oral care. So I'm gonna pass it back over. Now to Araceli, and she's going to tell you about the barriers, because sometimes there are barriers to brushing those teeth. Yeah, so there's uh, barriers to good oral care. Uh, just a little background, in early stages of Alzheimer's, we can focus on dental care and following a routine in order to prevent infection. However, as our loved ones, uh, prog our patients progress into more advanced stages, there may be some challenges that come along with that, including the inability to engage due to several things. They may be more forgetful, they may have a little bit of uh, altered mental status, maybe in a, some inattention, um, or they may have some functional limitations, which could be the inability to hold the toothbrush. And we won't know that until we hand them the toothbrush and kind of assess that and just say, here you go, I'm going to hand you the toothbrush. Can you hold it in your hand and kind of see what they're able to do and what they're not able to do? And we can give them as much uh, 
independence and include them as much in the process as possible. They may have some fatigue or vision loss, or maybe we have the patients with Parkinson's that would uh, want to do it, but their inability to do so will kind of put us in a place where we would need to help them out in order for them to get a really good quality oral care. Another thing to consider is that patients with Alzheimer's may have a little bit of a misunderstanding about the situation altogether, depending on the severity of, this, of their uh, condition at that point. They may see what we're doing as something that could be uh, threatening or just different from the routine, and they may not initially be willing to participate. However, if we introduce and develop a routine early on and just add things slowly, we can uh, hopefully overcome some of these challenges. Um, other things would be, uh, as Joria mentioned, the risk for aspiration or choking. Some patients or caregivers may be kind of reluctant to try something like this because they're afraid that the patients are going to choke, it's going to go down the wrong pipe. However, if we start slow and keep in mind that um, we're going to be there to help our patients or, or our loved ones um, and slowly introduce things that we're we're going to be okay with doing uh, doing so uh, another thing is as dementia progresses their cognitive their memory skills maybe their language maybe their orientation can be affected and their sense of self is kind of distorted. So we just kind of want to help to reassure them that they're in a good place, we're here to help them. Okay, great. So we're gonna do another picture here, and this is just the anatomy of um, if you swallowed something, how it can get very easily right down into the lungs. Um, you know, healthy adults, like I said, we all microaspirate things, go down the wrong pipe. We talked about that before. Um, I know when we're working with our loved ones or the people that we're caring for, it's so important to remember that when they're eating or drinking, the best position is for them to be sitting straight up. I know that it's um, often easier. Uh, some of them must be laying in bed or they're um, bedridden, but really um, that puts them at so much more risk as you can see by the anatomy picture here of that straight line that can go right into the lungs. So if possible, best thing to do is lift the head of bed straight up when eating or drinking or taking medications or performing the tooth brushing or oral care if it must be done in bed. Otherwise, we really would recommend that they sit straight up when eating, drinking, or doing tooth brushing or even standing um, when they do their tooth brushing over a sink if optimal. I know that's not always optimal. Uh, we're not always able to get um, those people up to the sink, but um, just wanted to show this picture just to let you know that um, the risk is higher when they are laying or even um, not sitting straight up. Some other things to consider. Um, make sure that you are inspecting the mouth. Make sure that you can look inside the mouth. Um, you can look for dryness, as Araceli was talking about before, cracked lips, uh, inside coated tongue, uh, sores inside the mouth, any of these things that cause pain or discomfort are really going to um, impede you from getting in there with a toothbrush because that's going to cause pain. Um, we don't want to inflict pain, so we need to address those issues um, first and foremost, um, especially if they're refusing to brush teeth because you're wondering why. Why are they refusing to brush teeth? That might be as simple as just getting rid of some of this dry mouth or addressing any sores in the mouth. Sensitive teeth or gum as well, gums as well. Uh, brushing the teeth doesn't always have to be with cold water. We had mentioned before that warm water might do that. Some people might have cold or heat sensitivity with their teeth, so you might try um, a different temperature of water. We talked about difficulty swallowing. You can't always use um, a swish and spit or use a gulp of water to rinse as well. You might need to use a damp toothbrush that's not completely wet. You can dip it in a little bit of water, shake it out, and make sure that there isn't a large amount of liquid in their mouth to be dealt with or that they cannot um, swallow. Having a towel to catch any of this, actually even using a soft washcloth to 
to um, go along the gum line or go put it um, even over your finger if you can do a thinner washcloth and dip it in warm water and kind of go in and along the line of their gums and that instead of a toothbrush can be used as well to to pull out some of the debris that you may have if you can't get a, a full toothbrush or you're worried about them swallowing too much liquid or unable to swallow too much liquid um, you might notice too that if they have pain or discomfort that might change their eating habits too so if they're chewing on one side um, maybe it's because the other side is hurting them or if they don't take anything in at all they don't want to eat or drink look for for those as signs and things to consider that there might be a problem. Um, it might be a trip to the dentist or it might just be inspecting inside the mouth yourself to see if there's something that can be alleviated at home or in the care setting. This is really important. Tips to achieve our goal. We talked about how some of our patients with dementia and Alzheimer's, they might not understand or remember that this is something that we do routinely. So real simple instructions, making sure that we do things one step at a time and at their pace. You want to establish trust. You don't want there to be any fighting or arguing. Um, that will only make this an unpleasant event and you're sure that every time it will, will be an unpleasant event if that's how it um, happens. So if you need to take a break, walk away. If it's not working, don't push. Um, but always encourage. Encourage independence as well. So when you hand the toothbrush over, they may not know what to do with it, but you let them figure it out a little. Let them look at it. They might end up understanding, ah, I remember this is a toothbrush. Possibly, if not, slow paced, avoid rushing. Um, we had talked earlier in days in preparation of this that the thing that we do, even with our with our children, for example, as soon as we're rushing out the door, we're rushing, brush your teeth, brush your teeth. Um, if you're rushing, nobody wants to brush their teeth. Not even our own children will agree to wash, brush their teeth if we're rushing them and we're making um, um, rushed efforts. So please avoid rushing, slow pace, avoid distractions. Um, the best thing and the best place um, might be in the mirror and you might brush your teeth alongside of them if that's a possibility. So these visual cues and mirroring the action of tooth brushing, either they can watch themselves in the mirror to to brush their teeth or you might pick up a brush and show them how you do it and they can follow the cues. Um, smiling we put on here too because it's really important to make sure that we're um, posing this as a pleasant experience, that we're happy to do this, that we even show our bright smiling teeth, right? So we wanna, again, promote independence, let them hold the brush. If they can't because of some of those functional limitations that Araceli had talked about, you might try what we call the hand over hand technique. Uh, simply this is letting them hold the brush and you putting your hand over the top of their brush so they still have full control, but you're just guiding them into the motion of the tooth brushing um, and the tooth running over the teeth and gums. Um, this is sometimes helpful because it does let them feel like they are in, in control and they can um, control how, how quickly or how slowly the teeth are brushed and they can also um, learn to do this by themselves. So what do we do if, let's talk about uh, when our patients, loved ones, or people that we care for, what if they refuse? This could happen for many reasons as discussed previously, uh, but we can try a different approach. Maybe it's as simple as offering uh, a toothbrush during bath time, maybe when the patient is sitting at the table. It's mostly about trying to figure out when is a good time for them. And since most of us will be close to this patient or loved one, we kind of know when is a good time for them. Do they have, are mornings typically better for them? Do they have more difficulty remembering steps or participating in the afternoon? Then we can kind of gauge that and arrange our, our oral care and even our activities around that. We could try um, offering, of course, but don't, agitate the patient as Joya described because we want to make sure that they have a good experience with every approach. We might just have to go very slowly and start one little step at a time but if each step we introduce they've had a positive um, you know experience with it then they're more apt to continue this process. 
And just remember, when we provide good oral care, we're providing our patient, resident, loved one with improved oral health for a long time, and we're helping to boost their self-esteem. Uh, continuing trying a different approach, we may find that the mouthwash or the toothpaste may be a little spicy for them. So we wanna offer sips of water if this is possible and if the patient can tolerate that. So they can kind of uh, filter that out and just don't give up. Pat yourself on the back for trying. You're doing a great job. Know that you're doing a, a part to instill some dignity and, and respect for this patient, we're trying to give them a sense of control in the world. A lot of times they don't have that, that's something that's missing, and this could be one of the reasons why they're refusing. They may not understand. Again, those cognitive abilities may have um, changed for this patient. Um, they may have pain. All of these different barriers that we talked about in the beginning that could be causing uh, the refusal. Um, so we just want to explore those options and see what what's going to work. And and as I've said, just introduce one thing at a time so you can have a better idea of which item or which process that patient is having um, the most difficulty with. And then you can kind of hone in on that and take care of that one piece at a time. So we hope that you have enjoyed our presentation, that our topics have been helpful, and we want to support you on providing oral care, again, for your patient, loved one, or resident. We've enjoyed spending time with you this morning. And don't go I also go wanted anywhere. to show you, oh, I'm sorry, I also wanted to show you a list of references, because there's some great articles that you can look up, go to your local library, even when um, you're, we have hospital librarians as well. Some of the hospitals do have a librarian that could offer information on this. Um, and don't discount the local YouTube, <laughs> your YouTuber. If you have, like I do, um, my kids can get me on some of these great sites too. They really help me with that. But if you're, if you're not technically savvy, but if you are, you might want to check out, there was some amazing videos on YouTube that showed some tutorials about how to get someone to brush their teeth that wasn't interested in that. Um, there are some great literature references here as well. Um, Alzheimer's uh, Orange County has some great references as well. So um, don't give up. Keep trying. It's not an easy job, but um, remember that you're doing the best that you can to provide that oral care and to hopefully decrease infections. Wonderful. And I apologize. I started to interrupt you when you uh, changed to that important references slide. Uh, I want, this is Kim. I wanted to add that while you were talking, I posted an additional handout for everyone because I was just struck by uh, how a lot of the uh, dialogue around working with dementia patients and not pushing them and, and you know, trying to find a good time and, and some of the other techniques you mentioned just sort of reminded me of a standard handout that we have called Compassionate Communication with Individuals with Memory Loss. So. Uh, I went ahead and posted that and so that attendees can print that out as well. It's not specific to dental, but it's just, you know, those great uh, techniques about um, the do's and don'ts of dementia care and how to be more effective. And so I think that that might be helpful, especially if we have uh, some family members on the line. So if you want to print that out, you can just go to your handout box and click on that to print. And um, it is time now uh, for our question and answer period, and we have a lot. <laughs> so don't anyone go anywhere, because uh, again, you must be present for 60 minutes in order to get your CE. So this uh, whole section of the session, the Q&A piece, is very critical to your knowledge and understanding of the topic. And so um, one of the first questions that we have, and of course either uh, Joria or Araceli can, can answer, but the first question I have here is electric toothbrush or regular? 
which is better for the elderly and why? Gosh, you know, um, this is Joria, and, and I'm not a dentist, but I am um, working with patients and my own family members. So um, I want to say that either I would say whatever works for the person you're providing the care for, it really has to be their choice. Um, they might like the electric toothbrush. Some, some may like the electric toothbrush because maybe it feels good like a massage on the teeth or the massage of the gums, um, while others might not like the noise or feeling the vibration. So really, it's going to be a it's going to be a preference of the person that you're providing the care for. Um, I, I've seen I've seen um, here in our hospital that family members have brought in electric toothbrushes for their for their family members, and that was a preference. But while they're here, we offer um, people who don't bring their own. We offer a regular toothbrush. So again. Um, Either preference, um, we talked before too that the preference has to be that the toothpaste, even the flavor down to the flavor, that that's a um, <laughs> a preference in itself. So I would say that those electric toothbrushes, I could see probably would do a better job of taking down that plaque, just like that, that ugly picture that I had to show you. Uh, it would probably do a better mechanical job, but if they won't let you use that, then try, try any other thing that might work, even a different type of toothbrush. There are different sizes of toothbrush, different, the soft bristle is what we're recommending, but you might even go and um, when you go down the toothbrush aisle, there is actually a entire aisle or two of <laughs> toothbrush um, availability. So you can even try a child or a, or a toddler um, toothbrush as well, though we've had success with those as well, a different size to um, let them, or actually we, I have also used one that uh, lit up. I've seen one. If you go there, they're battery off. They have a battery. They're not electric, but they actually, the handle will light up and that could be um, something that might engage them as well. So I, I think it needs to be the preference of the person who's having their teeth brushed. Try, try different things. That sounds great. Um... An additional question is, do either of you have any specific recommendations for individuals with Parkinson's? Is there anything that you yeah, would add a, to? Yeah. Um, that's a, yeah, that's a tough one because we talked about that functional limitation and able to grip that. But um, if you are, if you do have the ability to possibly have your physician make a referral to an occupational therapist, mm -hmm. occupational therapy, they are skilled in uh, tools. I have seen them come to, again, we're in the hospital setting, so they can come to our patients here. Um, they bring to, uh, um, I'm, one, I'm remembering another, a patient with fork and knife that had an extra large handle so it could be gripped. Um, there was also, there's also some adaptions that they can, adaptations that they can make to things, like I said, forks and knives and teeth, toothbrushes and um, to help them with their activities of daily living. That's their specialty to make sure that um, they come in and do a correct assessment and then provide those tools for um, whatever the need. So ask for occupational therapy would be my um, recommendation for asking for a resource or a reference. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. I, I recall working with an individual who had a toothbrush that was built up. Um, you know, it, it had a, something that's, that made it much larger on the handle end and it helped the patient to have a better grip on it. So I think that was, yeah. as you said, something that uh, was mm -hmm. available through occupational therapy. So mm -hmm. Correct, and if, and if not, if the patient can't, can't grip, you might try, I know I talked about the hand over hand where if they are able to grip that you put your hand on top of their hand to guide the motion, but for a Parkinson's, uh, person who a person with Parkinson's who um, may not be able to do the gripping maybe you grip and you lay their hand on top of yours to do the guide um, and at least it gives them some control or sense of control possibly um, but that is a hard one if they're not able to actually grip the brush and would that hand over hand also work uh, if the patient had a tremor a pretty significant tremor then 
Oh, I, yes. I believe so. Yes, I believe so. Hand over hand is the um, is one of the greatest things I've seen. Um, I remember a, a video from Tipa Snow was her name, and I believe she is an occupational therapist, but she She's uses fantastic. that hand over hand. She's fantastic, and um, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of videos out there from Tipa Snow as well. I don't, I'm not plugging her. I don't know her, or, or I have no, I have no, um, nothing to gain from her. But she's just a wonderful resource, and she does hand over hand technique that's just amazing to get people to feel like they are in control, and also to get the help they need to to do the the teeth brushing or the eating or the the, the task correctly. Yeah, this is Kim again. I actually, um, you know, all of us here at Alzheimer's Orange County think Tifa Snow is one of the most terrific uh, Alzheimer trainers. And so she has a lot of YouTubes. And so there there may be one that could, that's just, you know, sort of focusing on dental care that you, you may find that and that would enhance all the great information that you two have already given us. But yeah, it's okay to say her name. She's quite highly regarded in the dementia field. Um, so good. So our next question um, is re with respect to uh, patients who wear dentures, how important is brushing their gums? Yes, that's an excellent question. It is important to clean their gums and uh, make sure that they have a clean mouth. It's important to keep, keep the appliance itself clean, but it's also important to keep their gum clean because, as we've mentioned before, they start to fill that residue starts to build on any portion of their mouth possible, and that's what's going to change their ability to taste food, to um, have an enjoyable experience with the texture of the foods that they eat or just to feel clean. And as we've mentioned, it's such an excellent opportunity to take a look inside of their mouth, just have them open their mouth and take a look in there and see what else might be going on in there that may be causing them discomfort or, um, you know, any, any kind of infection process that may be starting. We can kind of see that pretty quickly, especially if they have, uh, um, you know, their dentures out. That's an excellent excellent question and a good time to do that would be uh, when their dentures are out so just you know make sure that we do that and as I've said if the toothpaste or the mouthwash is too spicy I mean you can kind of see their face change I've seen my patients sometimes tell me and these are of, of course alert oriented patients tell me oh that was too spicy okay you know we can dilute the mouthwash we can try a different toothpaste just try different options and as Jory mentioned it's all about preference and seeing what works best with the patient with your loved one so uh, we can support them on that and make sure that they have a um, you know the best chance at having a healthy mouth great um... And I'm thinking, too, that's where you could use the washcloth that you talked about or a soft bristle brush, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that that'd be sense. a great that, great opportunity. Yeah, if they, especially if they can't swish and spit, which um, right. I don't know if the, some patients, if they can, that'd be swish and, swish and spit with a diluted um, a diluted mouthwash would, would yep. be great as well for that mouth. But if they can't do that, yeah, a little bit of diluted mouthwash or even just the warm water on the on the washcloth right around or even little, um, they sell little toothettes or little sponge capped a little stick with a sponge cap on the end, even those, if you dip them, dampen them, and then run those around the gums as well, um, that's really important to get that, what we call, remember, biofilm off that, off right. the gums and tongue. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, okay, let's see our next question. And again, uh, to all of our attendees, uh, stay online with us uh, all the way through till 1230 should you want to receive your CE and I would think you'd want to stay with us anyway because our speakers are so fascinating and this is such a great topic and questions are still coming in and so uh, our next one is do hospital nurses CNAs etc get proper training in helping uh, patients brush their teeth the right way to decrease decrease the uh, risk of pneumonia. So are they specifically trained? 
This is a great question for Araceli and I because this is our goal in well, this is our goal in life here it is. at Kaiser <laughs> um, to train um, staff to help them understand this as well. So I'll let Araceli talk to you about the wonderful poster that she takes around the hospital here in effort to, to for this effort. Yes, um, yes, and we do have uh, some training that we provide for the nurses and CNAs, as you've mentioned. Uh, first and foremost is to assess what the patient needs, what they're able to do, how independent are they, um, how feasible is it for them to get, you know, oral care traditionally. Of course, here in the hospital, we have some different tools such as the two thats that are hooked up to suction to help prevent um, to help prevent uh, the risk of aspiration but yes and and our patients are critically ill and so it's super important for them to brush their teeth and we say four times a day I know that sounds like a lot but we want to make sure that because they're they're sick and their immune system is is down it's compromised it's busy fighting the infection that they get as much support as they can so some of the things that we do as Joria mentioned is we we talk with our nurses we've had a campaign our CNAs where we talk about what the tools are and as we've shared with you the toothbrush the mouthwash um, how to take care of the dentures, um, how to properly sit a patient up to ensure that and, and that they're awake and alert enough to participate. Um, we kind of figure out what are they able to do? What's their dexterity like? You know, are they able to hold that toothbrush? Do we need to get a um, occupational therapist to come in and kind of work with the patient or make some modifications? Um, we talk about also um, making sure that we brush their teeth. And like I said, if they're alert and oriented, then we provide all of the tools necessary. Um, but if they need some assistance, then we, we definitely provide that. And Joria wanted to add a little bit here. <laughs> I just wanted to mention too, we are, we're lucky enough in the hospital that we actually have toothbrush with suction capability. So we do have a little bit more um, ability to do aggressive, uh, more aggressive, tooth brushing and mouth care because we do have that suction possibility and I don't know if that's a possibility you might look into that in the home setting where there there might be something that you can adapt uh, in the home setting I don't know if that's an, an available um, and I, I might be under a medical benefit so you might want to check with your medical provider to see if that's a possibility if you need that because that's really helpful for us here in the hospital to make sure that we're suctioning out any liquid that they can't um, manage themselves. So another thing about being in the hospital, we have a couple of couple of tricks and, uh, and things that are only sometimes available in the hospital that we can do. But we we do the the training has has been done by Aristelli herself and one of our own CNAs really yes. really really led that. So we're we're very proud of of our nursing assistants here for that. And we definitely do a, like a teach back method. So we kind of go over all of the information with our CNAs and, and our nurses and of course explain what the benefit the benefits are and how this can help improve the patients um, decreasing the risk of infection, decreasing pneumonia particularly. So and then we do a teach back method and, and kind of, you know, see what other resources we can we can help with and assess for any type of additional intervention. So yes, that was an, a great question. You'd be surprised, like I said, the, the, the slides that we've shown you with the bacteria and the mouth and things like that, we've also shown in the, in the education we provide. And I think those grab everyone's attention more than anything is that what happens if we don't do it. So um, always need to always need to show those pictures. Um, OK, great. And um, Araceli, congratulations on what sounds to be a highly effective uh, training program. Oh, thank you so Fantastic. much. Really Fantastic. excited. I'm sure that's a point of pride as well as it well <laughs> should be. Um, this is a great question. What do you do about someone who will not open their mouths uh, despite, you know, encouragement, et cetera? They just, they just won't open their mouths. What do we do? Yeah, we've had that too. We, we've actually encountered that. Um, we were lucky enough to have a family member who came in and they would they would open their mouth for them but not for us so uh -huh. um 
<laughs> it might take having maybe a different person ask or a different and it may not it may not work at all it may never work it may um so <laughs> and it's that's the hard truth but you just have to like we said pat yourself on the back you're trying you're doing your best it may not always work out but if you can try different approaches different um like i said maybe a different color toothbrush a distractor using the lit, lit up uh, version of a toothbrush or maybe the little tooth set or maybe um, just different maybe different person come and asking them to to open their mouth I, I, I think it's just all a lot of trial and error and I know being a caregiver for someone with a with a cognitive impairment or a dementia is it, it is extremely frustrating and um, it ha you have the days when you're not going to get any cooperation and I think you just need to give, your, give yourself um, <laughs> assurance that you're trying your best and you're trying to do the best for them and if, if you can't get them to agree um, maybe just let it go don't agitate or irritate because it won't get better uh, step away from the situation and then try another time and I know you said I, I can see the question it says what if they just continue not to not to cooperate or continue um, it's just a lot of patience and a lot of trying and and do you do, know that you're doing your best yeah, absolutely. I was just thinking um, as you were talking about this that there are also those who will open their mouth, but then they will promptly bite down and not release. So it's it's a little bit the same, isn't it? I mean, it's just sort of a um, I think there might trial be, and error. It's yeah, like trial, trial and error. error right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's move on then. Let's see. Um, flossing. <laughs> Is that necessary for older adults, especially frail elderly uh, folks? Yeah, actually, I think a dentist would tell you yes. Um, I, I know my own personal dentist tells me only floss the te teeth I'd like to keep. That's what he says. So um, um, I try to follow that. I, actually, I don't even follow that every day. So I think that if you can get in there and brush teeth, that's amazing. If you can floss or do anything else, you are extra amazing. Because if that if that can occur, I believe that your dentist would be very excited about that. Because flossing is is uh, well, it's very important, you know, to, to get between the teeth as well. We're brushing usually just does the external portion. So, um, kudos to you if you can if you can get that done. That that would be great. Okay, um, mouthwash <laughs> is mouthwash a deal breaker? Uh, I cannot get my person to use it. Yeah, that's a, that's a hard one because it's pretty harsh. I mean, even myself, I, I'll have to dilute if it's a Listerine or something like in a, a brand name, uh, I'll have to dilute it. But um, there again, if you if you can do mouthwash, it's it's a plus. It's a plus. We really want the mechanical um, brushing of the teeth to remove that plaque off the gums. But if you can get a um, a mouthwash in. Also remember there's other, when we talked about the different flavors of toothpaste, there's, not everything is the minty harsh flavor. Maybe try a different flavor. I know if you go to the um, the children's aisle, and I know we don't treat these people like children at all, they're not, but we do sometimes need to use the things that are less um, harsh or abrasive. You might go there, they have things that are uh, cherry flavored, bubblegum flavored, orange flavored. So you might try a different flavor that might be more pleasing to them. But again, it's all trial and error and it'll be preference. So just uh, keep trying. But most importantly is the brushing. Um, you know, someone just made a comment on the same topic that I'll share about mouthwash. Uh, she said, I understand that using a mouthwash disrupts the balance of the oral microbiome and is not recommended. Mouthwash can destroy the good bacteria, changing the balance toward the negative bacteria. And I've heard that too. I have heard that some of these, um, the very astringent mouthwashes can can do that. So I know here in the hospital, we use things that are more, they're less astringent and they're more what we call moisture balanced. So they're, um, and I believe, I know I know the brand name and I don't know if I'm not supposed to say it, but Biotene is actually um, something that's more of a mouth 
moisturizer, they call it. It's not the abrasive, harsh chemicals that you're, you're right, because just like, um, just like they get rid of the bad germs, some of those good microorganisms in your mouth can be flushed out too. You're exactly, I, I believe you're right. So again, I'm not a dentist, but I, I, um, I know the chemical makeups of what we're talking about. Um, and here in the hospital, we do use something that is more neutral. It's more of a mouth moisturizer than a, um, than the uh, astringent things that, um, that you're talking about, I believe. So I, I agree with you. Uh, and then finally, uh, well, we have, we, we have several questions. So here's what I'm going to tell all of our listeners. Um, we're approaching the 60 minute mark. And so you certainly can leave at 1230 if you were logged in at 1130 sharp. But I encourage you, we just have a couple more questions. So we'd really like to encourage everyone to stay. Uh, we're getting, I, I would add, uh, to our presenters that we're getting such great feedback from people saying how valuable this session has been. Uh, and so this is a very important topic. So try to hang in there with us for a few more minutes as we get through some of these great questions that you're sending in. Um, and suggestions. One participant is saying, well, you know, why not try finger brushing for gums? Um, and, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. They do have, um, like I said, if you look in the children's aisle, they have the small little silicone um, um, tip fingertips that go over the, they slip over your fingertip and they have small um, brushing bristles. Um, those are, yeah, and like I said, and then with that thin washcloth, you can mimic that as well too, is what we've, uh, we've tried as well if we don't have that actual um, fingertip brush, but that's a great recommendation. So I, I'm seeing some of those as well on the chat, some great mm -hmm. recommendations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as well as um, California Registered Dental Hygienist Advanced Practice, uh, a group called RDHAP, and everyone has this information in your chat. Uh, they will perform professional oral hygiene treatment and help with recommendations to improve daily uh, oral hygiene care for the patients in their own home or in an RCFE or a SNF. So that's another great resource from one of our attendees. Um, uh, for those, this, this is a great question too. Uh, for those who are bedridden, is there a list of mobile dentists and hygienists that one can obtain uh, or is there a website that they can go to? So these are patients that are homebound and bedridden, either in their own home or in an RCFE. Is there a traveling uh, dentist or hygienist that can come to them in their setting? I don't have information about that, but that, that would be a great resource if anyone can type in there if they know of one. You know, I think our helpline might have information about that, the Alzheimer's uh, Orange County uh, helpline. So you might try calling that, and I will put the number in the chat. Um, and then there's a question, is brushing good enough, is brushing enough for good oral care? And asking again about flossing. So I, I think you've kind of addressed this, but I think basically you said if flossing is important if you can get them to do that, correct? Correct, yeah, I, I, like I said, you gotta, do, you gotta do what they'll let you do and you gotta try and try again sometimes, but I think that the, the brushing in any way, whether it be with, like you said, the fingertip or the uh, running a towel over the, um, washcloth over the gums or actual brush, the, that, that would be the, the great, anything added would be a bonus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is using warm salt water a good idea? I have not heard that. Maybe some of our dentists or hygienists on the line can chat in about that. I don't know the answer to the warm salt water. <laughs> okay. I know I, I know I personally gargle with that when I have a sore throat, but I don't know. Uh, I, <laughs> I do don't know. Too. Uh -huh. I, I, I that's the too. old wives' tale, right? To gargle with salt water. I, I but I don't know the um I don't know if that would be recommended or not. What about um glycerin swabs? Actually, we don't in the hospital setting, we believe that those dry the mouth out more than they help. We okay. we, we really try to stay away 
from that again we're, we're trying to moisture balance not and those tend to be drying and aseptic so um okay but we don't it, that's our own uh our preference here is not to use those okay gotcha all right well um <laughs> questions are still coming uh and suggestions so i'm going to do one more and then i think we're we are going to go have uh go ahead and end but you should all be able to see some of these resources that are being sent out. Um, as we asked the question about mobile dentists, there were a couple of organizations that uh, we we had that we received through the chat, and you should be able to see them as well. And then this suggestion is about a bite block, uh, and the uh, the attendee is saying a soft bite block was given to me to avoid getting bitten bitten while rushing, oh, it says while rushing my loved one's teeth, but I'm sure the, I'm sure they meant brushing. So yeah. Oh, that sounds block. like a, that sounds like a great idea. I did not, I don't know about that and hadn't heard about that, but I can see how that can be very helpful to keep the mouth open. Yeah. yeah I, think, I, I don't, I haven't tried that. Maybe so again, the, the dentist or hygienist on the line that they might've seen that they might be able to chat in about that. Yeah, and I think those bite blocks are uh, helpful, too, when you're providing end-of-life care. Um, and it's a good way to, to make sure that you can perform some of that comfort care, and keeping the mouth moist and, and all of that, removing secretions. So, okay. So, um, let's see. I think I need to send everybody the number for our helpline because I promised that. And then with that, uh, I'll put that in. And then I just uh, need to go ahead and end the webinar. But before we do, uh, thank you, Araceli and, and Joria, so much uh, for your time and for your expertise. And uh, as I said, we're already receiving such great feedback on both of you. So maybe we can bring you back again sometime. Uh, thank you very much from thank all of the you. Yeah, thank from, you, all. Thank yeah, you for having all, us. All of the partners, thank you. O'Connor Mortuary, Alzheimer's Orange County, and of course Care Choices, Hospice, hospice and Palliative uh, Services. Our next webinar, first of all, watch for your uh, watch for your evaluation, which should pop up on your screen immediately when you leave. Uh, and remember that you must return that, either do it online right now or do it via email within four days uh, in order to receive your uh, CE credit for today's class. And then we are looking forward to seeing all of you back next month where we will um, be talking about um, coping with anticipatory grief, anticipated grief. And we have Dr. Uh, Bill Hoy with us for that topic and I'm sure many of you have heard of him he is uh, he's from Baylor University he's just he's had so much experience in palliative care and providing pastoral care and bereavement programs and he's just a wonderful wonderful speaker uh, and so be sure and join us on Tuesday November 13th at 1130 once again so again on behalf of all of our sponsors Thank you uh, for joining, and I wish everyone a wonderful week.